She won most talkative in high school, and she has been running her mouth ever since. Welcome to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast with your host, Lisa Fisher. Okay, it is a power hour of uh, a think tank here, and because we have the premier thinker in the world of cancer, Dr. Thomas Seafried, and this is so exciting for Logan and I to be here. Um, Dr. Seafried, just knowing what you've done with the research and the metabolic approach and how you came to the forefront of our knowledge probably about 10 years ago, first define to us what the metabolic mitochondrial approach is to cancer, and why did you pick that? is uh, a path for research. Oh, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, well, it's kind of a circuitous path. It wasn't like I woke up one day and say, okay, um, let's resolve cancer using metabolic therapy. <laughs> um, it, it, it came uh, through a large uh, amount of work that I had done on brain biochemistry um, glycolipid biochemistry, and then having been a major participant in the American Society for Epilepsy uh, for many, many years, uh, and knowing um, mapping genes for epilepsy, and then realizing that ketogenic diets are a, a major tool for managing epileptic seizures, um, but uh, realizing that calorie restriction, water-only fasting, and these things could also manage seizures. Uh, but we were also having parallel studies on cancer uh, brain cancer, uh, biochemistry, basically. Uh, but then when we started to realize that um, some of the same therapies we were using to manage epileptic seizures could also be effective for managing brain cancer, uh, I began to dig deeper into the mechanisms by which that might happen. Everything would bring you back then to the work of Otto Warburg, the famous scientist from the 1920s, uh, who clearly showed without any doubt that uh, all cancers are defective in their ability to use oxygen for energy and then uh, become dependent on ancient fermentation pathways using glucose, as what he said. Um, we have absolutely validated that. Uh, and we have found in no uncertain terms that the other fuel that he did not know about is glutamine. But the glutamine is also fermented just like the glucose is, but it's through a different pathway. It's through the glutaminolysis pathway. Most folks in the field today know about glutamine uh, and dri as, dri as a driver of cancer, but they all believe it's, it's re uh, respired. Use, oxygen is used to get the energy out of glutamine. Uh, wrong. We, we showed that it was fermented. So that's the big thing. The big thing is that Otto Warburg was correct. He just did not have all of the facts that he needed to uh, bring this whole new uh, paradigm forward. So he was lost in battles with others about oxygen consumption and uh, cancer cells that don't need glucose. And, and he wasn't aware of the glutamine fermentation. So once you, once you realize all of the issues that led to the big uh, controversy, um, then you start clearing it all out. And then the field ran off, uh, the whole cancer field ran off like lemmings over the cliff uh, uh, chasing genes, uh, where is where we are today. Uh, the entire right. cancer world thinks that um, all these immunotherapies and all these precision medicines and all this nonsense, this is, this is the way they think it is, but it's not that. And uh, it's a metabolic disease. And most of what you see advertised on television and all these things, uh, they're all based on the somatic mutation theory uh, which replaced Otto Warburg's view that cancer was a metabolic disease. Uh, we have now re 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 righted the ship and say, no, Warburg was right. Cancer is a metabolic disease driven by two fermentable fuels, glucose and glutamine, and not able to uh, use ketone bodies or fatty acids for energy. Very simple. Once you understand that, now you have a path for uh, a non-toxic management of the majority of cancers. The big problem is that it's, I might as well be talking to plug sockets because it's, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it, it's like deer in the head, like, oh, it's like, oh, I, I don't know what to say. It's like beyond my comprehension. Um, so, uh, but it'll take time because I think people want to live. And, the, and if they have cancer, they want to know how to manage it without having their hair fall out, their gums bleed. And, uh, and do all these crazy things that we do to cancer patients. Uh, not to say that we, will never, we, we don't want to use these things. It's just that you really have to know how to use them the correct way. 
um, I'm not saying we don't use radiation or chemo or any of this other stuff. I'm just saying the way we're using it today is inappropriate and, 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 and not and not in the best way. So uh, uh, we can we can uh, change this whole thing and make it a hell of a lot easier for most people. Logan, as a parent of somebody who has heard the diagnosis, the dreaded words that your son, who was four years old, was he was he Landers four at, uh, four at the time he was diagnosed yeah. five when he had stage four Wilms tumor. Um, and I know you went through Logan, you probably didn't have a lot of choices there for your son at the time. Now that you know you're three or four years out from that cancer diagnosis and the treatment, what would you like to ask Dr. Seafried at this point in managing forward? I think the main thing is just somehow we've we got to get it to click. I, I remember going in there early on, what can I do? What, because I did not accept that as a parent, I, I had no control over the situation. And, you know, point blank. Now, I got to be very careful I, because, uh, you know, Children's Hospital has been great to us and, and we are where we right. are for what happened. But I, I, I t- really kind of... Uh, relentlessly dove down everything I possibly could. And, and your work actually came up very early on along with, uh, you know, Simon Cheney, Ravici, uh, Gonzalez. And so everything that I possibly could to figure out what's going on. And that metabolic aspect came up pretty early on when I came across insulin potentiated chemotherapy. So that, that really made, once I, I really dove into your work, it made a lot of sense. But even though I was I was reading it and I was trying to grasp it and apply it, there was no comprehension of that from the oncology department. It was, you know, eat whatever you want. It doesn't matter. They give sugar to every kid. So, you know, Lander went from stage four to cancer free in eight months. Right. Like we did conventional. We did have surgery, chemo and, and then a few rounds of radiation. But there's a lot of other babies that did not even remotely have the same progression that he did. And so I tirelessly am working to help get your message out because I think that that is the core fundamental thing along with some adjunctive therapies. But I'm at a loss too because I get asked a lot, what should I do? What could I do? And then it's just like, that's where it stops because the oncologist says, well, that doesn't matter. There's no proof. Right. Mm. Yeah, yeah. How do you talk, how, how do we approach that or broach the subject, Dr. Seafried, with conventional uh, oncologists about using either a hybrid approach, which I've heard you talk about with Dr. Hyman and Max Lugavere, or actually just saying, let's throw caution to the wind and stop feeding the cancer with sugar? Yeah, you know, it's such a, you know, Lisa, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm at a loss. Um, because I, I have friends that are oncologists and, um, they tell me they never heard, uh, that sugar, uh, is a fuel for cancer. Um, if you go to their clinics, they say, uh, in fact, at the Mayo Clinic, some, one of the, uh, glioblastoma individuals who contacted me, uh, for information went to Mayo Clinic and the oncologist there said, sugar has nothing to do with brain cancer. And, and I have, I, we published a paper in 2003 showing a direct uh, correlation between how high blood sugar is and how fast a brain tumor in a mouse would grow. And since I published that paper, dozens of others have come out in the brain cancer field and in other fields, lung cancer, breast cancer, all these cancers, showing a clear absolutely strikingly clear connection between the level of sugar in your blood and how fast your tumor is going to grow. And this goes back to what Otto Warburg said. If the, if the, can, the, the sugar is there to drive energy without oxygen, it's a fuel for fermentation. See, we're doing all the science behind this and knowing, and knowing uh, how you kill tumor cells. They can't. Uh, so you have to say, what do they need to grow? They, f- they ferment. What does that mean? They get energy without oxygen. Oh, okay. What are the fuels that drive energy without oxygen? And the fuel is glucose <laughs> and glutamine. And, and it, it becomes very clear. We did all, we're doing it as we speak, the, the, the rigorous experiments. We can't find any cancer cell that can live for very long without those two fuels. Now, the, the key is you have to transition the body over to ketones 
uh, because the tumor cell can't use ketones. So what we do is we to bring the whole body into a state of therapeutic or nutritional ketosis. What's that? That allows you to push blood sugars down really, really low because your body brain doesn't need glucose if it has ketones. So that's what we first step is bring your body into nutritional ketosis. The tumor cells uh, don't die from that, but they, they don't grow very fast. Um, they become much more indolent. Then once your body is transitioned, it's like putting a protective shield on all your different, on all your normal cells. And then you go in and you, and you take and you, and you target uh, further glucose and glutamine with repurposed drugs. And you start, you start blasting away at this tumor gradually. And it starts to up and die. And not only that, your body, uh, the cells that used to be getting glucose as their normal fuel are now knowing that the body is, is lowering the blood sugar and their, their uh, re response to sugar is much greater. So the normal cells of your body start to have a direct uh, um, a challenge to the tumor cells. They're making a direct competition for the first time. So your tumor cells with high glucose, your normal cells are just hanging around. When you lower the blood sugar, the normal cells now put direct pressure on the tumor cells, and then you hit those tumor cells with some drugs that block their glutamine, and you gradually degrade this tumor without the toxicity. Are you passionate about the groundbreaking and heroic research of Dr. Thomas Seifert on metabolic therapy and cancer? So are we. That's why we've created something special for you, in collaboration with Johnny Rockermeyer, a German book publisher and translator. Introducing our collection of meticulously crafted books that distill the essence of Dr. Seyfried's work. Dive into the science and discoveries. These summary books are your gateway to understanding the intricate world of metabolic ketogenic therapy in a clear, concise, and engaging way. Whether you're new to the subject or a seasoned enthusiast, our books offer insights that can change your life. Ready to explore this transformative knowledge? Visit our website at www.cancerasametabolicdisease.com to get your copy. You can buy the ebook there directly and the paper book via the provided links. Here's the best part. A portion of every purchase goes directly to support Dr. Thomas Seyfried's groundbreaking research. That's why the direct ebook purchase is the best option to donate as much as possible. You can see all of the donations Mr. Rockermeyer has already made at www.ketoforcancer.net. That's right, when you buy our books, you're not just investing in your own knowledge, you're also contributing to the future of cancer research. Help us make a difference. Together, we can drive change and save lives. Um, we did all that. We're, we're publishing this. As a matter of fact, we just put out a paper in bioarchives with pediatric glioma, um, which is the number one killer of little kids. Uh, a pediatric oh. glioma is the number one uh, reason oh. for death from children with cancer. Uh, we showed that um, ketogenic metabolic therapy used with the parasite drug embendazole together with Diministat. Now, Diministat is a very interesting drug. It was used in the clinics for pancreatic cancer, and it was a bust. It didn't work. Um, so they, it, you know, the trials showed no no therapeutic benefit. We tested it on our on our preclinical pediatric glioma model, and just like for pancreatic cancer in adult humans, it didn't work. But when we put it together with the restricted diet, together with that unbelievable, you, this thing was like a, 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 all of us, we have a lot of drugs out there that would take on new and greater power at lower doses uh, when, when administered when the body is in nutritional ketosis. So all of a sudden you open up your tool chest and you have a, a wealth of things that you could be using that work really, really well. It's just that the field thinks cancer is a genetic disease. <laughs> It's not, it's, it's not a it's genetic not. disease. So you have to change the theory under which people view the disease. So if you go to the National Cancer Institute of the United States, it says on their webpage, cancer is a genetic disease. They're not even mentioning this and metabolic stuff. They said, oh yeah, we understand metabolism, but it's gene driven. Uh, wrong. We did the nuclear transfer experiment show these genes are largely irrelevant. So, um, and yet we're spending billions of dollars uh, focusing on precision medicines uh, that will not only uh, have the potential to manage the cancer, but also cause hyper-progressive disease and kill you before the cancer does. So, right. um, and you hear about these on TV, pdl one As a matter of fact, they talk more about the way the drug is going to kill you than, than the way it's going to help you. And, and the population right. of people are just sitting there. I mean, what are they... 
uh, you know, I, I'm saying to myself, this is nuts. <laughs> we have people dying every day. We have 1,600 people a day dying from cancer in the United States. And a lot of these deaths are horrific. Uh, I mean, we're using medieval kinds of treatments and making it sound yes. like it's state of the art. And it's medieval stuff. And it's not based on the wrong concept of what the disease is. So when Logan is talking about his son's, um, you know, there are so many more things. If the cancer were ever to recur or any of these things would happen. I mean, we have we have drugs. Now, the problem is the Food and Drug Administration doesn't uh, permit these drugs to be available or they're not they're not uh, either known or recognized. So um, I, I'm not sure what how we how we uh, approach that problem, breach that problem. I, I, I don't know. All, all I can say is we I have a clear understanding of what cancer is. I have a clear scientific uh, uh, background to know this. And I have uh, many, many people that are using metabolic therapies that are doing really well. Is it, is it a panacea for all? No, I, I mean, you have, to, you have to, it's a strategy. You have to treat the patient up front with metabolic therapy gradually, and then we can bring in radiation and, and these other kinds of drugs towards the end of the treatment. When the cancer cells are just hanging on and every week, you might hit them with a little cisplatin. You might hit them with a little lumistine yeah. uh, or one yeah. of these kinds of things. But the way we're doing it is all backwards today. And it's based on the wrong theory. And consequently, you have 1,600 people a day dying from this disease mm. when it doesn't have to be. Dr. Seyfried, and horrific deaths. I, one thing that is extremely evident in the alternative world that I am very much a part of is there is a whole lot of self-care going on, a whole lot of self-treatment and things that are being applied and they're working. Uh, you know, you had mentioned uh, Fembendazole a couple of times. Like there's a whole community of people uh, online. It scares me because there's a lot of bad advice out there and Man. extremes, right? And and that that's the downside. But I don't know that we are going to be able to change the medical system just because it is what it is. It's a big, big ship. It's hard to turn, right? What I have found, and I'm very curious to know if you have any experience with, is it seems like the high-dose melatonin is gaining in popularity. The exogenous ketones is gaining. Methylene blue, all of these things are being used, right or wrong. I'm, I'm just asking if that is yeah. something that you have seen as some sort of an adjunctive to the ketogenic diet, because we can't, we can't get a lot of those drugs. I can't go get the, the glutamine inhibitors, um, and I can't find anything natural outside of potentially berberine that does uh, what, what we're talking about. So do you have, you have any experience with Yeah, those well, I, I, don't, I don't like to speak about things that I haven't tested in, in our preclinical systems. Um, I know about the methylene blue very, very clearly. I, I mean, uh, I haven't tested it. Uh, I, I like to see, we have developed here at Boston College, the single best animal models uh, for stem cell tumors, metastatic tumors, and these kinds of things. They have the ma matched biology of what, of what the human condition would have. So I like to uh, speak only after I've tested in our system uh, what, what this, this might, might do. I, because I, I also uh, like to know what the molecular mechanism of action is of, of, of of some of these things. I can't, I can't speak to melatonin um, because here, here's the situation. Um, we know that there are only two fuels that these tumor cells can, can use. So if melatonin or any of these things have an effect, you have to show that in some way they're targeting the, gly the, the glycolysis and the glutaminolysis pathways because that could explain uh, their mechanism of action. And as a matter of fact, some of the drugs that we use uh, that people have used uh, that have uh, had some uh, therapeutic benefit, when you start to look at what those drugs do, you end up seeing that in one way or another, they're targeting the glycolysis or glutaminolysis pathways, pathways unbeknownst to the person that was using it. So uh, in order to gain credibility of any kind of uh, alternative uh, approach, it would always be good uh, to uh, have powerful preclinical pre data to show that, and the cancers have to be done in natural cancers, uh, like uh, not these genetically engineered things that we that a lot of people use, they use genetically engineered cancer cells in a genetically engineered mouse, you know, and they publish big papers in Science and all these top journals on things that are artificially created under artificial conditions. You need to take you need to take the natural. We have natural uh, cancers in the in the mouse, and also the dog model. The dog. We published a major paper on mast cell cancer in the dog. 
uh, using metabolic therapy. You know, the same thing as humans. Oh, the dog has to have radiation, chemo, and it's going to be very sick, and it probably won't <laughs> live that. I mean, if you look at our paper that we published on mast cell tumor using a calorie-restricted keto without any drugs, it was shocking. And, and, and almost like your son, I mean, this, this cancer just com completely dissolved. So, uh, um, and I think we're just at the, at the beginning of knowing how to do diet drug combos uh, that will manage these cancers and possibly eliminate them. I don't like to say, wow. don't ever say anything that I say we cure cancer. All I'm saying is we have a new path for managing the disease more effectively than the current path we're on. Whether it leads to the cures of people, that might be great, but we don't know. But all I know is if someone is diagnosed with a stage four cancer and says, you know, you have six or eight months or a year to live, and that person is alive with a good state of health 10 years out, then, you know, maybe at 11 years they die of cancer. I, I don't know. But they live a hell of a lot longer than they were predicted uh, to live. And uh, I think we're just beginning scratching the surface because it's like anything. We now know what the, the weakest point, we now know the Achilles heel of these cancer cells. We now, we now know precisely uh, what they need to survive. And we now know how to target those survival. Without energy, nothing can grow, period. It all comes down to energy. What's driving dysregulated growth in the cancer cell? It's fermentation. How do you know that? Because the cells can grow without oxygen. There's only two main fuels that can do that, glucose and glutamine. And there's not a single clinic anywhere on the planet, as we speak right now, that is targeting glucose and glutamine in the patient's transition to nutritional ketosis. So there you, there you go, right there. Well, it, so if we know that cancer has a sweet tooth with glucose, I think we can all agree we all know how to approach glucose, but I still don't know what glutamine is. And I kind of thought I needed it, but I guess I don't. No, 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 no. Glutamine is the, one of the most essential amino acids in our body. This is why you have to know what to do. So uh, our gut needs glutamine. Our immune system needs glutamine. Right. Okay. Okay. Urea cycle needs glutamine. Glutamine is an un unbelievably important amino acid in our body. It's an amino acid. All right. It's one of the 20 amino acids that circulate. They consider it a non-essential non amino acid because we can make glutamine from glucose. OK, normal body can make. Right. However, it's an essential, absolutely essential amino acid for a cancer cell. But it's not so essential yeah. for the rest of the body. Now, you can't go in and, and, and there's no diet that we know of, except my late great friend, uh, George Cahill, who was the president of the Joslin Diabetes Center down here in Boston. Uh, after 21, uh, 14 to 21 day water only fasting, blood glutamine does go down. Um, but we like to use drugs. Um, uh, and the drug would be used only after the body would be in nutritional ketosis. Uh, and you do it sparingly. We call it um, press pulse therapy that I, we developed with some of my colleagues, Dom D'Agostino and Joe Maroon at Pittsburgh. Um, we put this together. And once you have to, what we call pulsing means you use a short amount of it at a certain time when the body is in a pressed state on glucose. So again, it's, you got to, you have to know how to work with the tools you have to maximize the therapeutic efficacy of what you're doing. And this is where some knowledge comes in. And this is where we are at the cutting edge is dosage timing and scheduling. What is the best drug what timing and scheduling to work uh, with the glucose press? So, um, and we call this unsexy science um, because it's, um, <laughs> oh, people don't get it, you know, but, but the idea is it's, it's going to take care of your cancer in a better way than what's presently being done, whether it's sexy or not. To the guy who's getting benefit from this, he's probably elated. But the guys that are working in a lot of the research labs, oh, that is not really too exciting to us. But, you know, but our goal is to keep people alive in a, quali in a, in a healthier state. And I consider that far more sexy or, or uh, 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 wanting to do this than, than uh, some of the, the, they always say, what's the molecular mechanism of this? You know, let's kill all the cancer cells first, keep the patient healthy. Then we'll go back and figure out, you know, yeah. uh, what's going on. But let's not allow all these poor folks to be dying miserably in these treatment centers while we try to figure out the molecular minutia by, by which uh, some of this stuff works. I, we have, I have a general idea how it's working. And uh, uh, that's all I need to know to go after these things. And uh, let, let's 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 uh, let's let's go that way. I can always go back and, and let somebody else do that. I, I, I let's. 
I've seen your uh, I, I've seen this quote attributed to you. Of course, I've never heard you say it, but I think Ben Azadi has quoted it, and Logan. And I think we've discussed it that mm -hmm. you said after a seven day water fast that cancer cells, your cancer load drops by like ninety five percent or whatever that is. Can Can you back that up? Is there a statement you well, said that's it, similar to that? Yeah. Well, I I don't I don't I can't say for seven days. Um, I've seen like Guy Tannenbaum with his uh, met a metastatic prostate cancer, he did a series of, of uh, 20 day water only fasting. Um, and he was able to largely resolve the cancer. I I've had people tell me these really long fasts, uh, uh, 20 days. Now people think, and you know, when I, when I started doing all this, we knew this because we were doing it in, in, in mouse studies and we know how to make the, con the, the, the conversions from human to mice based on basal, basal metabolic rate differences between species. But it became clear to us that a 40% calorie restriction in a mouse is like water only fasting in a human. And uh, then I said, wow, what about water only fasting? There's a lot of reports uh, where long fasts, uh, just the cancer cells um, really suffer. Uh, when you when you when you begin to do that, as I said, the body. I even wrote it in my book. It's called autolytic autolytic cannibalism, and the body turns on the tumor cells and uses the tumor cells as food. Um, so when right. your body when your when your body starts to be under an extreme uh, calorie restriction fasting, every cell in the body must carry its own weight uh, energetically. Anything that's unfit, weak, lame is eliminated. Okay, there's a tremendous house cleaning process that goes on in our bodies. Right, and you have a bunch of tumor cells that are unfit, containing mutations and and all these things. They're not carrying their weight. So what happens is our immune system attacks them, dissolves the material from the tumor, and distributes it to the good cells in the body. It's called autolytic cannibalism, and it's a, it's linked to the concept of autophagy which is a well-known right. biological phenomenon. So, but you know, a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to fast for that long. I'm going to die. So that's why we came up with um, uh, the concept of press pulse therapeutic strategy, where it's a combination uh, of, of these together to make it less uh, uh, difficult for the cancer patient. And like you said, Logan, it's very important when you do metabolic therapy, you now have control or you are now a, uh, the patient and the family are participating directly in the management of your of your condition. You are no longer a simple bystander in this process. So the family and the patient are all working together as a unit, a family unit, a team. They know that in order to manage this cancer, we may have to change a little bit of our lifestyles in order to uh, manage yeah. this. So clearly, uh, a lot more of the of the burden of treatment does fall on the patient when they do metabolic therapy. But from my discussions with large numbers of people, they feel empowered to know that they are actually participating mm -hmm. in the recovery of their health. The other thing we find is that as uh, in our press pulse therapy, uh, we when patients enter the clinic uh, with cancer diagnosis. Uh, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes they have many other or several other maladies like high blood pressure, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, obesity. They have a number of different uh, uh, comorbidities. Oh, besides, they have some form of cancer. One of the remarkable things about metabolic therapy is not only do you slowly degrade the tumor, but you often find that you have a recovery of diabetes, uh, hypertension, right. blood pressure. You, you, you actually become you enter, you exit the metabolic program uh, super healthy. I mean, besides the besides the fact that your tumor is gone, but um, uh, or gone or at least managed. We we have uh, Pablo Kelly in, in Devon, England. He came to me in nineteen uh, twenty fourteen, and uh, with a glioblastoma, and he mm -hmm. uh, they gave him nine months to live without any uh, conventional treatment, and um, he took no radiation, no chemo, no steroids. Um, he's still alive today, nine years out, but his tumor is still there. Okay. So did you, did metabolic therapy cure Pablo? No. Did metabolic therapy allow Pablo to live far, far longer than he should have? Yes. 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 So, I mean, yeah. this is the thing. We don't know if we cure anybody, but we certainly allow people to live a hell of a lot longer, just like Maggie Jones. 
and, and these others, may, may, maybe right. uh, Logan's son. Uh, uh, the, the idea here is that you're, 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 you're allowing people to survive far longer than would have been expected using standard of care alone. Logan, I know you have a million questions, so I'll let you jump in. <laughs> Lisa, you have no idea. <laughs> or maybe you do. So <laughs> I do. No, very I do. early on, I read the China study, okay? And it scared me to death and to where I completely, you know, took out meat, and, but I continued diving in to, to understand. And so I am very curious as far as your take on meat and because I've even gone from the extreme of what I believed was accurate with the China study to participating in carnivore very regularly. Yes. And so yes. does meat cause cancer and what is your take on, on, you know, a meat heavy diet? You know, Great meat, question. meat does not cause cancer. As a matter of fact, sugar does not cause cancer. Um, what causes cancer is dis dysfunctional uh, respiration in a cell. Then you have to say what causes this dysfunctional respiration in a cell, and 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 that could be carcinogens, uh, irradiation, uh, stress, cr constant chronic stress, yeah. intermittent hypoxia, chronic inflammation. You can go down the list. Any of these things uh, uh, could be what's provocative to damaging oxidative phosphorylation in a particular population of cells in a particular organ. So uh, when it comes to diet. Uh, some people say, oh, I did a strict vegan diet and my cancer was managed, or I did a complete carnivore diet, my cancer was managed. So people say, well, what should I eat meat? Should I eat vegetables? So that's why we developed the glucose ketone index calculator. What it does is it allows, all we know is that uh, we lower blood sugar and elevate ketones. And if you can get into a, a GKI ratio of 2.0 or below, um, it doesn't make any difference what you're eating. Uh, if you can do that with a plant diet, uh, that's wonderful. If you can do that with a meat diet, that's great. If you can do it with a fish diet, a Mediterranean diet, I don't care. Well, I always ask the patient, what's your GKI? And, and people will say, well, I've been on these plants for a long time and I can't get below 10. Well, I said, maybe you should try something else. Um, you, you know, you know you, you're going to shoot for these numbers. So uh, do it until you can get to the number. Once you're in the 2.0 or below the glucose ketone index, now you take the drugs and you go after the cancer with these drugs that'll blast that will blast them apart. So again, this is a this is I can't tell you how many people have emailed me and called me and saying, you know, I can't I can't get down. I said, well, try doing water only fasting. That'll bring you down. <laughs> so uh, so uh, and then they'll say, and once you do that, then you know what you can eat and not eat to maintain. That this is the way we did it with the kids with epilepsy. Okay. You know, once we once we found a, a a kid with epilepsy, we'd keep his blood sugar really really stable, and then he and then he he wouldn't seize. But it was the shifts in blood sugar. Now with Kate with epilepsy, you could see an immediate effect of falling out of the zone because the kid would would have a seizure, which was obvious to everybody around. And uh, but with cancer, you can't see a group of cancer cells growing uh, like you can see an epileptic seizure. So, uh, but you know that if you're in a steady low GKI, like my good friend, Dominic D'Agostino, he's, he's always in, in, a, in, a, in a, we evolved, we're actually a species that evolved to be in ketosis all the time. And, and traditional right. uh, people in, in, uh, who, who uh, are Aboriginal folks that live in different parts of the world that follow their traditional diets and lifestyles, cancer is rare. It's almost non-existent in some mm -hmm. of these folks because they're, they're, they're living the way we evolved uh, as a species. Now, what steps do you think people ought to take? Should children even in, incorporate fasting? Well, I think you... To get we, us to ketosis. Yeah, well, we, we, we learned an awful lot about that with ketogenic diets for the kids with epilepsy. Because most of the children, they're mostly children. And they're little, you know, okay. a, a year or two old. They can be up to, you know, uh, very infant, okay. so, uh, you know, toddlers and this kind. Um, but you have to be very careful. Again, uh, many of the folks that know a lot about this uh, are in the epilepsy field uh, because they're working. And this is another crazy thing. Um, I know from my discussions with folks at Johns Hopkins that you could be the pediatric epilepsy clinic is here and down the hall is the pediatric oncology uh, uh, section. And there's absolutely no discussion between the groups. Um, you know, mm. what they should be doing in the oncology is what they're doing in the epilepsy, except using metabolic therapy, like we said, for these little kids with brain tumors. And uh, they're not doing it at all. And uh, but you have to know as the child develops, you have to have a, a metabolic approach that's going to allow the body to develop normally. 
And uh, this is why you have to be very careful. And, and mothers and parents of children with epilepsy are well aware of this. So they're always in that zone of keeping the, can the seizures under control, but not allowing the child to fall into a developmental malady of some sort. So okay. again, dietitian right. nutritionists that understand that are essential, but they also have to understand why the cancer in this. So again, I'm flipping between epilepsy and cancer, uh, mainly because right. as I have a, a lot of experience in those areas. And uh, again, it all comes down to diet nutrition and knowing how drugs work with that new metabolic state. And this is the, this is the beginning of, of, the new, of the new paradigm. So uh, there's going to, in oncology, it's going to have to be a team of folks. It's going to have to be the person that administers the drugs at the right time and the right dosages and consultation with dietitians so that they know that this is the do dosage that's going to make that drug work the best while not compromising the development of the child if it's a, ch a child or keeping, uh, keeping an adult in, in metabolic homeostasis. So again, it's, it's learning an awful lot using the, the tools that we have. And uh, this, I think, is going to make a huge difference on the outcome uh, and eventual management of cancer. Okay, Logan, go ahead. I know you're, you're thirsty. Yeah. Got to ask I, a question. I, I just go back. I don't like just hammering on problems, 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 right? And so, like, the lack of being in control is something I've never accepted. Like, there is something I can do. So what what I have found with your approach that I agree with wholeheartedly is it goes against the grain of the medical system. We can't do anything about that. What we can do is this self-care approach. And so I, I guess I'm going back to the, there's got to be some more adjunctive things that we can do uh, along the lines. I just whether, you know, Travis Christopherson's work, I mean, he's he's right up there with you in my book on, on, on getting that information out to where it can be applied to, to us. Um, are you familiar with a relatively new development with melatonin in that the vast majority of it is produced by the mitochondria and as, as a detoxification? And if so, can you explain that to me? No, I can't. I haven't studied it. I've heard about it, but I... I you know, it's one of those things where uh, people talk a lot about it. Uh, I haven't tested it, uh, and I, I don't. I, I can't. I can't really speak to that at all. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. You know, I, I need I know. to do. And, I need, and the reason I, I, I keep okay, so, at that is because it's something we can do, right? Like yeah, that well, is something uh, that's see, attainable. Yeah, it, it, to do to do these experiments, people people have to realize number one, they're very expensive. And number two, they're extremely labor intensive. Um, uh, uh -huh. uh, pre preclinical studies are not cheap. Um, and we've been doing preclinical studies since I, I came to Boston College here 35 years ago from Yale University. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, Travis Christofferson's Foundation for Cancer Metabolic Therapies is a big supporter of our research. The more money that are, is donated to Travis, the more of these kinds of experiments I can do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could certainly, if someone were to give Travis $100,000 to do a melatonin experiment, I could do a melatonin experiment in, on brain cancer and various cancers to let people know, uh, uh, know in certain terms uh, whether or not uh, we have a therapeutic benefit. But I'm not going to uh, uh, speculate on, on whether melatonin is going to be as powerful as 6-deoxynorleucine, uh, which is Dawn. Uh, or embendazole, because those guys are powerful. Um, could melatonin uh, work synergistically with these? That might be possible, because we are building diet drug cocktails. And that's another thing mm -hmm. that uh, when you, um, uh, Logan, when you mentioned the, me the, 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 the field itself, um, we, we are limited uh, by the so-called clinical trial paradigm itself where you have one drug uh, and a placebo, and then you double blind. You can't do that with, with um, uh, metabolic therapy. Metabolic therapy are diet and drugs, uh, and you have to know the individual's ability to handle um, uh, different food sources. Then you make a decision about how you're going to stratify that individual. This whole has to change. This whole thing has to change. So uh, uh, how you evaluate this. And, you know, I know the resistance from the oncology departments 
and medical schools. Um, but you have to realize the cancer patient is the consumer. Um, I, you know, there's two things here. You don't want to see pa people running off and, and, and doing witchcraft and, and, and doing snake oil stuff that has no scientific uh, val uh, validity. And you also feel bad that the guys that you should be helping you work through this are, are, are blind to it. So, um, so that's the problem. And I, I think it has to work together. Okay. At some point, we're going to have to retrain the folks in the medical schools, and we're going to have to keep cancer patients from running off doing all this kind of crazy stuff that doesn't have scientific uh, validity. So I, our work is one of the few where we absolutely go from the bed to the bedside. So when I see something that uh, I, I see in our preclinical system, I immediately tell my front folks, my friends in the oncology clinic, you might want to combine this and that. And then they feed back and they say, man, this stuff is, is really good. So, uh, um, so that's the way it, it has to work. And yes, uh, we use people. Um, uh, some guys, I mean, we have to use people to figure out what's going on. And, uh, you know, some guy says, hey, man, I'm doing really well. That person I'm not doing as well. Okay, we, we can adjust his diet and, and we can adjust the drugs to make him uh, experience the same positive benefit. But again, how, uh, you're right, Logan. You're, you're, you're 100% correct. I can't tell you how many f uh, people have gone to their oncology and had the door slammed in their face or say glucose has nothing oh. to do with this. It's just everywhere. All the time. So that, what do we call it? We have it to re-educate. And if, if, and we're going to, and believe me, I, I'm training and, and we're working on a, a, a comprehensive treatment protocol right now for glioblastoma, which with a few tweaks will work for almost all cancers. But um, again, wow. if you have a protocol in your hand, a, a, a how to uh, a manual, do this, do that, do this, do that, um, and you start to see outcomes that you would have not expected in the positive direction, then listen, patients are going to want it. Uh, and the and the medical established are going to have to make the change. Otherwise, there's going to be new clinics set up that are going to do exactly this. Yeah. And so it's just a matter of time. Well, I mean, I, I've heard you say, Dr. Seafried, I heard you say it on, on Mark Hyman and Max Lugavir. It's dogma that drives physicians to adopt a model <laughs> and then stay in that path. But we also have to admit that there's a financial benefit for writing the reimbursement mm -hmm. from insurance companies to these oncologists is, is impressive. Yeah, it's enormous. Yeah. And if we know that uh, only, well, I think the statistic is something like only 3% of cancers are treated or cured with chemotherapy, then and maybe you're just saying it's the education. Some aren't educated, but don't you have to admit that financial gain has something to do with it? Oh, yeah, of course. As um, Upton, Upton Sinclair said, you can get somebody to accept what you're saying if their salary depends on them not accepting it. <laughs> it's very simple. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, it's just so. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, that's a temp. I would say that's temporary. Uh, and that's why I think we probably would need a hybrid system where where we yeah. would have some we, we can't replace uh, one paradigm with another, uh, um, unless there's some blending between, so people can adjust to the new yeah. concepts. Listen, as I always say, the business of America is business. Somebody's going to figure out how to make a profit on metabolic therapy. Uh, right now, that yeah. doesn't seem to be uh, happening. Uh, my, my goal yeah. is not to make a billion dollars on metabolic therapy. My goal is only to prove that it actually works and is better than the current system that we have. I said, so there's plenty of reward in just knowing that. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, there will be entrepreneurs. Uh, these folks will come down the pike at some point and, and be able to set up the kinds of clinics that could possibly uh, uh, generate the kinds of revenue uh, that might be uh, people would, would be expecting. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to that. I'm just saying, if let's do the right thing. But I, but I understand, Logan. Uh, you're not alone, man. I, I can tell you, I, I get hundreds and hundreds of emails uh, mm. with really horrific stories uh, about the, the the doors shut in the face and the the, the resistance to accepting this. And and it, 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 it's just not just the money, but money plays a huge role. Uh, but it's just the way that the edu the, the physicians are educated in, in the medical schools. It's the way the National Cancer Institute distributes their research funds. Um, <sighs> cancer is a genetic disease, according to them. 
And if you want to do uh, your, your value to a medical school is how much research money you bring. You have two values. Number one, you bring in a lot of grants. And number two, you make a lot of money with revenue seeing patients. So it's re how are you going to generate revenue for the medical school is either through NIH grants um, uh, or, or, or seeing a lot of patients. Um, you know, unless some wonderful guy comes along and says, you know, here's a hundred million dollars, the Jimmy fund and all these kinds of incredible, uh, revenue generators, uh, pink ribbon campaigns, you know, all that money is largely wasted because it goes into right. the same, the same paradigm that cancer is a genetic disease. So, um, you just know it, it's just like a, it's a big system a revenue generating system and there's no accountability. No, everybody seems to feel good that I'm raising money, but where, where are the, where's the outcome? Where, 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 where's the uh, outcome from this? Why don't we see a drop in cancer? Why every year it's going up? The mm -hmm. more money we raise for cancer research, the more cancer we get. And it's been going on year in and year out. And the people who, who are running and jumping and bicycling, they're the ones who benefit more than the, the, the money they've given to the, to the schools to do more gene sequencing and uh, 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 PDL1 and CAR T immunotherapy and viruses in the brain. I mean, you can't make stuff up like this. This is like nuts. And uh, all we have to do is pull the plug on the, uh, on the fermentable fuels. You get a much better outcome, <laughs> you know, but that can't be right because right. there's no revenue generation associated with it. Right. So, uh, yeah, we're so up true. against a number of, of walls here. That's okay. I mean, this is what I do for a living. So and teach, <laughs> teach students in biology, the program, and we'll educate them. Go ahead, Logan. I know you want to ask something. I just want to know if you're serious about if we raise a hundred thousand dollars, you'll do a melatonin study. Andrew, yeah, I could for a hundred thousand oh. dollars, <laughs> I could run a melatonin study. Absolutely, and we can no. publish it in a peer re peer reviewed. That's the other thing. If you raise money for a study, the donors want to see did you publish that, and you can go onto the oh. web. You can go onto the web. And look at the papers that we have published. And what would be very interesting, look at the funders who fund us. And there's a lot of names of individuals who have given us money and private foundations who give us money. And there's one, there was one, a, a, a prison from Virginia, I believe, a, a police, a, 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 a benevolent fund from one of the prisons uh, gave us, gave us money and we acknowledge them. So, uh, um, we acknowledge those who fund our work, okay? And, and, uh, and I, I say Travis Christofferson's foundation has been instrumental in allowing us to do the kinds of experiments uh, uh, that we can do. You're interested in melatonin? I'd be happy to run a melatonin uh, test. But as I said, it's $100,000. Why does it cost so much money? Because we have to pay for all these mouse cages. We have to pay the animal fees. And we have to pay the people. In the in my people, my professional scientists, we work with each mouse as if it were a patient. OK, um, we put them mm -hmm. in a separate cage. We monitor everything they're doing, uh, all of this. And we have big groups. And after we finish the study, we do it all over again to see whether the first time we did it, the second time we get the same results. And after we do that, we do it all over again because we want to be 100 percent sure that uh, we don't want to be saying anything that's not true. And another lab says, well, I didn't, I didn't get the same results. Well, if you do what we do, and we did it over and over again, that's why it costs so much money. And it takes a couple of years. It doesn't like, oh, we're going to run this thing real quick. It takes, it takes a couple, sometimes three years to run a comprehensive study on a particular, on a particular uh, compound. So it's not, it's not cheap, and, and it's hard to do. And, and but we can do it. I mean, there's no question about it. So hundred thousand dollars. Well, they, they just deposited a hundred million dollars down to the, the Dana Farber thing down there and all the, and all the money wow. they're getting. And uh, our, wow. our, our studies are a drop in the bucket compared to and there's no and there's no um, accountability for all the money they get down. There. I don't know what they're doing down there. Right. You know, right. so, um, well, you talked um, earlier about autophagy and those of us in the intermittent fasting space. You know, that's something Dr. Fung talks about. I don't know. Do, do you know, is there a targeted time that we all for sure reach the place where our cells um, eliminate the sick cells and we eliminate them through waste? Is that about hour 20 of the fast? What, what do you think? Oh, yeah, I think that has to be what do you uh, know? Age, age, uh, the, the state of the person uh, at, at the time they begin it. Okay. Uh, the age okay. of, of the person. All, all of this makes a, a, a lot of difference. Okay. So older folks are obviously are much more, uh, uh, they, they don't uh, uh, fall into these 
into these states as fast as younger folks. I mean, it's just the way it is. Oh, you know, so okay. it's not again, it's not one shoe fits all. Um, when we do mouse right. studies, obviously, all the animals are matched for sex and age and weight. And, uh, you know, so there's like a, a, a very, very uh, 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 similar, similar individuals. And that's another thing. When we start our experiments, um, we, we have to make sure every uh, we, all of the groups have to be absolutely matched for sex and weight and age, age, sex, and weight. Oh. So we have very, so we can uh, parse out real differences when we see them, because if you don't do that, you don't know if it was because you started with different body weights, the mice were different ages and different sexes. And even in, and that's another thing in humans, sex uh, plays a huge role. Women and men uh, do not respond exactly the same to water only fasting. Uh, women, women can seem to get higher ketone levels than men. And I think that um, uh, has to do with the storage of body fat in women's body for, for child rearing. And so right. we have to look at sex differences and all of these things have to be accounted for uh, when we do these kinds of experiments. So just to let you know the details, if you ever read our papers in real detail, you'll see all of the different um, uh, experimental designs that we use and all the details in setting up uh, compare uh, uh, our groups before we start the experiment. Sometimes we have to discuss an experiment for several, several weeks before we initiate the experiment, just to make sure we've covered all the bases. We've looked at all the different things. It's like, you don't want to send a rocket into space without making sure everything is right. Uh, because then if something goes wrong, you've wasted a lot of time and, and, and money on this whole thing. So you really, we have big group meetings. We talk about the strategy, how many animals in a group, what's our strategy, how are we going to do this? And then we get the results, we analyze it, and then we make, then we do it again if and we adjust it here and there. And uh, um, uh, we'll eventually come to the uh, a firm, clear understanding as to whether a particular compound is therapeutic, has therapeutic benefit or not. And, and uh, you know, some people, let me, let me um, also say, that in some of our experiments, people have funded us for various things and the results did not come out uh, the way uh, they had a mm -hmm. preconceived notion about some drug from a company that says, oh, this is a, I'll test it. It doesn't do anything. I'm sorry. Well, they get all angry. You know, it's almost like uh, <laughs> they thought they, they had this yeah. really good drug and it was going to do this and that. And I test it and I said, oh, I'm sorry, it didn't do that. And then they get angry at you and say, what number do you, would you like me to change? Sorry, you know, because I, I don't really have, a, I don't care. I just want to see what works and what doesn't work, you know. And if something works, like what we're showing now, you read that paper that we just put out on the childhood glioma, uh, where we use diet and two drugs together at works. And I'd be, I would say that when you, when you, if you did that in a pediatric oncology clinic, it's going to work if you do it the right way. And these little kids are going to have a much better uh, opportunity to survive. Why is it not being done? Cancer is a genetic disease, not a metabolic disease. <laughs> yeah, right. We've got to change that. Dr. Seafree, we'll wrap things up, but please tell me you never plan on retiring because we need your brain. We need your yeah. vigor, enthusiasm, and your ability to get stuff done. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, no, I don't plan to retire anytime soon. Good. Um, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're that we're, we're doing. I want to see people alive uh, uh, beyond expectations, uh, like Pablo Kelly and 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 Maggie Jones yeah. and all these others. And Maggie's collecting yeah. all these folks. I I can't believe we we we're, we're starting to find all these so-called dead. Well, they say terminal cancer, right? They well, yeah. they're, they're all walking around, look pretty healthy to me. I don't know who's. I mean, I might be I more terminal than those people. You know, just, I know. You know. Yeah, that she has an incredible. I interviewed her yesterday. We're going to air it um, uh, after we air this interview because they have a big uh, cancer symposium. Uh, Logan, I was going to send you the information about, but they're documentarians and they're they're doing film yeah. and um, a series on people who have all been told stage four uh, metastasize or a yeah. cancer metastasis and how they've turned it around. Yeah. They're oh, thriving. Yeah. That's what they say. Yeah. They're thriving. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's the bottom line. Thri you're, 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 yeah. you're alive and doing well. Your quality of life is good. And, that's right. And, and your and quality of life is yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. That's it. It, it. It's almost criminal what we do with the quality of life with cancer patients, but that's a whole nother hour talk. Dr. Seafried, thank you so much for doing this today. Uh, I, I know your time is valuable. We're just small peons in Arkansas, but I tell you, we have big mouths. Mm -hmm. Logan has a huge influence because of his story. And I've been running my mouth for a hundred years here. So people listen to me. So okay. thank you. Okay.
Okay, well, great. Thank you very much.